this lecture series with a major challenge, and that is to address the issue of how we might be able to regenerate an organ that we all depend on minute by minute, but that is one of the most intractable organs to regenerate in our entire body, and that's the heart. So the heart, of course, as you know, is a very complex organ that forms very early in development and continues to function throughout our lives. And yet if you find it on our chart here, you see that it is one of the lowest regenerating tissues in mammals and it has some of the lowest cell turnover outside of the brain. Now what is uh, the function of a heart? Well it's a pump and it pumps in two different ways. Seen here in the animation, we're going to first look at the right ventricle atrium connection in which cells are being brought out of the low oxygen starved body and pumped into the lungs. And if we look at the right hand side of the heart, oxygen rich cells are being brought out of the lungs and pumped back into the body. And if we look at the two sets of two chambers together, we see this marvelous coordination which allows us to take our blood out of our body and put it back into our body in a completely different oxygen state. So with that kind of extraordinarily important function, which goes on from the minute you start to be a human being somewhere in that embryogenic uh, gray zone, when your heart starts to beat, till the day you die, that you can't miss a beat. Well, a few, but that's about all. And so that heart has to go on and on and on. And would you think that that would be the one place that would be full of stem cells? And yet, it's not. It's so bad that when people get heart attacks, which means a cessation of uh, the function of the heart due to an injury, it's often a lethal, eventually, a lethal condition. So what is a heart attack? So I'm going to show you on this little, on this little model here. So that's about the size of a human heart. It's about the size of your fist. And the two chambers that we saw before are more or less here, the two big chambers that essentially drive your heart. And if you see how much muscle there is, it's a bulging muscle. I mean, it's essentially all muscle. It has to be because it's a pump. It's pumping and pumping. The only way that you can keep this heart in th this incredibly uh, ready state where it can give a beat every minute or every, well, give 60 beats a minute or whatever it is, <laughs> is if these veins and arteries called the coronary circulation are fully open and operating. So the heart not only pumps for the body, it pumps for itself. And the way it does so is to take a little bit of blood out of the highly oxygenated uh, blood that's coming through the aorta and divert it into its own muscle to hold that muscle in a state of eternal readiness to, to work. Now, if there is any problem with this circulation, you essentially deprive the heart muscle of oxygen. And as you know, without oxygen, tissues can't live. And so a heart attack is usually caused by a problem in one of your arteries. So assume that this is then one of your arteries running through your heart. This artery is probably my artery after having spent five years in Italy eating too much rich food. Namely, all of this yellow stuff in here is called plaque. And it's a collection of cholesterol which builds up in the inner sides of your blood vessels over time. And this can be a genetic cause or it can be a lifestyle cause. But at some point during this period, there's the danger that some kind of a rupture can occur through some kind of a mechanical injury in that plaque and blood can flow out into your blood vessel that actually causes, because it's an injury, a clot. And that clot, to close the injury against the outside, which is in fact the blood vessel, can dislodge and get stuck in one of these descending arteries right here. And then what happens is that you see what we call an infarct. On the left here you see the blocked artery has caused an area of damage shown here as a sort of black smudge. What's going on there? The dying myocytes shown in purple are of course 
n not able to contract anymore, and the ones that are surviving around the side try to divide, but myocytes aren't very good at dividing. And what happens eventually is that the scar tends to actually grow. And the reason it grows is that the, the myocytes around the scar start to expand and become larger and hypertrophic because they have to still do the same job for the whole heart that that healthy part did. Yet those larger myocytes eventually get to the point where they can't get any bigger and yet the heart is still having to pump, at which point they actually end up dying. So what eventually happens is that this original, often rather minor injury that people don't even know happened, then turns into a major problem because the heart starts to fail. It cannot actually pump anymore. And then you have heart failure. Now, this is a really important problem in the Western world. And obviously, it's something that many people have considered as a prime target for therapy, and particularly stem cell therapy, because we are looking at a loss of tissue. That's exactly what a heart attack gives you. It gives you the loss of the myocardium. However, Scientists, biologists, have noted for a long time that this incapacity for the mammalian heart to regenerate is in fact not something that it shares with some of the lower organisms. And here we see again regenerative capacity on the left and evolutionary scale on the right. And again, we see that some of our lower vertebrate cousins can do a much better job. So let's have a look at this, the fish. The fish is capable of regenerating its heart in the most remarkable way. And for that, we're going to see a video. Zebrafish, which any of you who are fish fanciers keep in the, in the fish tank, can get to be about two inches long. It's got a little heart with just two chambers, one atrium and one ventricle, and that pumps blood throughout the whole body past the gills, which are the equivalent of the lung in a fish. The heart is very muscular, just like our heart. Inside, there are very thick muscular walls that allow the heart to effectively pump throughout this very um, complex series of, of veins. Now let's see what happens <clears throat> if we cut off the tip of the heart. Ouch! Ow! Don't worry. The fish is okay. It's okay. The fish immediately closes up that wound. Within seconds, the clotting process starts up. Now, in our heart, what would happen is there'd be a big clot, and eventually that clot would essentially heal over, but nothing more would happen. But Ken Poss and his co-workers have recently noted that aside from the fact that there are cells within the zebrafish myocardium in the red muscle that can actually activate like satellite cells and start to divide to make new muscle, there's also this slowly proliferating, engulfing layer of single cells on the outside of the heart called the epicardium, which is um, a mad, really a magic layer of cells because it engulfs the whole scar area. And then, in a really remarkable series of events that recapitulate developmental biology of the heart, a series of growth factors, in this case a growth factor called fibroblast growth factor, is produced by the heart as it's regenerating. And this fibroblast growth factor, or FGF, docks into epicardial cells set on the edge of the heart. And those epicardial cells, with this signal, know to march into the myocardium. So there they are, marching in. <laughs> now, the next thing they do, obviously now we're in a macroscopic picture, is a very important, absolutely fundamental part of, of making new muscle, which is to vascularize it. So with the new veins in there, the fish ends up with a brand new heart with new muscle, and not only new muscle, but all of the appropriate coronary vasculature to innervate it. And the fish can actually survive and swim away. So we can't do that. But boy, boy, would we like to be able to do that. I mean, I don't want my heart cut up, but if it ever happened, I'd like to be able to swim away like that. Now, what's the difference between fish and mammals, really, then? Well, let's just look at it from a very simplistic point of view. Hearts can regenerate with tissue replacement in a fish. Several different layers of cells seem to be involved. There seem to be stem cells within the myocardium, and then this magical layer that is the origin of the coronary vasculature in development for the heart, seems to recapitulate 
that same program and become, again, capable of making new blood vessels. In the human, heart failure is caused by tissue loss and no replacement. So what are the possible ways that we could address this problem? Well, we could study the fish, and that's exactly what people are doing. What makes it so possible for a fish to be able to do this? But we can't wait as human beings to understand exactly what's happening in the fish. We'd like to be able to start treating the patients who are in the clinics right now. Can we replace heart cells to treat the disease? Well, this idea actually has its origins in some very intriguing observations early on in heart transplant medical practice. So in a transplant, a truly failed heart that can no longer work is removed and a healthy heart from a donor is put in its place. And you literally sew the veins and the, and the arteries onto the new heart and the new heart can function more or less as the old heart did. This is a very complex procedure. It's very expensive and it, the problem is there aren't that many hearts floating around to use for the many, many people who need them. Nevertheless, the fact is that when you put a heart into a foreign host, you can ask interesting questions about that heart. 